This is Thrivenomics presented by Thrive Mortgage. Hello, Slancha. Cheers to uh, to you wherever you are listening. Uh, we've got a special episode today. I'm going to get to our guest, Henry Croson, here in a minute. Uh, before we launch into today's topic, we uh, just a, a real quick uh, tidbit about our title sponsor. Title sponsor for this podcast is Thrive Mortgage. We excel at providing legendary lending experiences to our clients and uh, are uh, licensed in multiple states, coast to coast. So chances are good if you're listening to us, then there's a Thrive Mortgage Loan Officer somewhere in your vicinity. We would be happy to connect you with them. So reach out to us if there's any any need that you have regarding a, uh, a purchase or a refinance of a residential property. We would love to help you at that and uh, help you out with can't talk anymore. <laughs> I'd love to help you out with that and, uh, and do what we do to, to make our, uh, make our clients experience. So, so legendary. So with that being said, I uh, would love to introduce you to our guest today. It's Henry Croson, founder of Croson Wines based in Johnson City, Texas. How are you doing today, Henry? Man, I'm joyful. How are you? I'm doing wonderful. You brought refreshments. So, uh, <laughs> so thank you very much for that. The reason why we wanted to have Henry on is because we felt like uh, the the wine industry, especially in Central Texas, has gotten so big over the last five to ten years. Wine is uh, obviously is a very popular adult beverage, and um, there's uh, there's a, a lot that most people don't know about how to properly enjoy wine, how to how to really kind of get into it and and really enjoy just uh, sampling the different flavors, different ways that you can use it, how you pair it with different types of food and that kind of mm-hmm. thing. So, and a lot of people are kind of in that position where they. They just open a bottle of wine, they just drink it and go on about their day or evening and, um, and, and then call it good, but they, they're missing out on so, so much opportunity. And if you know anything about the wine industry in central Texas, you, uh, you know, that it's, it's really gotten to be a big business and, uh, over the last several years. And, and that's one of the things I want, uh, want to talk about with Henry, um, but uh, really, we just wanted an excuse for for him to to bring in some some free <laughs> beverages yeah, and yes. partake. So uh, so Henry, thank you for uh, for driving in and joining us this week. I really yeah, really man. appreciate it. Super super exciting. Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, um, let's talk, let's let's go back to the beginning for you. And uh, as as you, you uh, as you top us off with our, our next uh, sample, um, what is it about? wine and winemaking that you are, what, what, what was it that got you passionate about doing this as a career uh, and as your livelihood? Man, I, I went on a really great date once. Hey, fantastic. Uh, well, I went on a couple of really great <laughs> dates, but there was one, uh, one particular date that was, uh, uniquely wine focused. So my right. wife, she grew up in Dripping Springs, okay. which is about 30 minutes outside of Austin and, uh, 25 minutes from Johnson city where okay. I currently, uh, conduct business but uh I visited her and her family while I was in school over Christmas break in 2010 Mm -hmm. and we went wine tasting for the first time I wanted to take her on a nice date and uh started tasting Texas wines out there on the highway Uh and I thought they were beautiful and romantic obviously one of my favorite things about wine is wine is only as good as the experience associated with it Mm -hmm. you know you could you could be drinking a 250 fifty dollar bottle of first growth Bordeaux and if you're drinking that beautiful bottle of wine with a jerk, it might not be <laughs> that good, sour man. Real yeah. Quick. Whereas you know you could drink makes, a, makes a lot of sense. It does. <laughs> it, or you could drink a six dollar bottle of Yellowtail yeah. Shiraz. Uh-huh. And if you're with someone you really love, man, it yeah. might not be that bad. Sure. Wine is uh wine is very personal, and you know we went wine tasting, and I thought the wines were were beautiful, and obviously the company was awesome. Mm-hmm. And then um, started pursuing more and more wines over the next few years. I did work in the restaurant industry when I was in school, mm-hmm. and uh, I, I did time essentially but <laughs> working in the restaurant industry. I was exposed to a lot of really cool wines. Right. So I started tasting more and more wines while I was in school and working. And, um, January, 2014 was when I moved out to work, uh, out here in the Texas wine trail. I applied uh-huh. for and got a job, um, started my wine industry career in, uh, 2014. Nice. And it was, uh, moving, moving fast. Yeah. We, uh, Mm-hmm. Started off in the office, transitioned to the cellar pretty quickly. I wanted to be around the wine and be around mm-hmm. the barrels. Um, started learning how to make wine. I had a really huge moment happen in November 2015. November 2015, I drank a Zinfandel from Sonoma. Yeah. And this particular Zinfandel, it was the first wine I'd ever had. It was made with just one ingredient, grapes. And that was it, man. And that wine, it, it blew my hair back and changed my life. I've been chasing those flavors ever since. So that yeah. is when I wanted to start my own winery. Right now, 
we're one of the only wineries in Texas that makes wine with, with no additives. So no right. added yeast, no added acids, no, no added sugars, no added sulfites, no filtration. I mean, you look at this, it's cloudy. Right. Um, oh, wow. But it's a style of wine that I was exposed to in November 2015 and was so attracted to, again, at that point, that was the best wine I ever had. And that's all I wanted to do was make the best wine. Right. Which, again, that's opinion-based. But uh, for me, it manifested itself in, uh, in these wines that we're tasting today. And we opened our doors for tasting in May 2018. So uh -huh. I had that wine in November 2015. Asked for permission to buy some grapes from my bosses in 2016. Mm -hmm. 2016, I processed enough fruit for about 130 cases worth of wine, which is not a lot. Right. Um, 2017, things really changed. I got, a, got offered a job at a whiskey distillery, and this was a really beautiful opportunity. It was a brand new company. So it was the two owners and then myself, the three of mm -hmm. us. We were going to be building this business from the ground up, and I really wanted to be a part of that creative process, yeah. learn, mm -hmm. how to, learn how to start a business. Yeah. But also, whiskey and wine don't compete. So in 2017, I was in a position to process enough fruit for about 500 cases worth of wine. Mm -hmm. I would do that uh, after work in the evenings. And uh, 2017, started pursuing our license at our location in Johnson City. We became licensed in April 2018, left my job at the distillery in May 2018 to do this full time. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you don't like it, keep it to yourself. <laughs> <laughs> this is my enough. life now, man. I had a question. Uh, when you said uh, you asked to purchase grapes, mm -hmm. like how does that work? It's man, this was a, so I worked at William Chris Vineyards in high Texas and they're, they're an awesome, awesome winery. And, mm -hmm. you know, I was making their wine full time. Right. Uh, I was a part of, I think it was a five man cellar crew at the time and, uh, wanted to make my own wine on the side, but working at another winery, you know, it was my responsibility to make their wines. So yeah. asked for permission to, to buy some grapes and make sure I it see. was com comfortable for all of those involved. Right. Um, oh, okay. And they said, yeah, which is a really huge opportunity because they just as easily could have said no. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that has happened to people before um, at other wineries. But mm -hmm. oh, that's cool. the fact that I was able to make my own wine on the side while working at another winery, um, I mean, obviously mm -hmm. it's changed my life. Yeah. Cool. Mm -hmm. So what is this that we're, we're tasting first? This is a as yet unreleased hey. Sangiovese oh. rose. The rose, rose. I'm a rose fanatic. I could, well, I could drink it every day. Uh, sure. In Texas, it's hot for <laughs> nine months out of the year. <laughs> rose is an incredible candidate. Um, Works well. But this particular rose is 100% Sangiovese. And Sangiovese, okay. it's the most famous grape out of Italy. In mm -hmm. Italian, Sangiovese translates to the blood of Jove. And the Jove that they're referring to is Jupiter, the right. Roman cool. version of Zeus. Right. So to the Italians, this is quite literally the blood of God. Okay. Oh, nice. Which I think it's pretty stinking cool. Yeah, so th is. this is really interesting because the only Sangiovese that I've had is, has been just a, a straight up red. Mm -hmm. So how do you make a rosé with it being 100% Sangiovese? How do you make what typically turns into a, a red wine? How do you make it a rosé? Yeah, yeah. So Sangiovese is a red wine grape. Right. Rosé is when you take a red wine grape and you treat it as if it's a white wine grape. Okay. This goes back to the idea of grape skin contact. So when you harvest grapes, if you're making a red wine, the way that those red wine grapes get their, or red wines get their color is by the juice being in contact with the grape skins themselves. So general rule of thumb, the juice on the inside of wine grapes is white. Right. All red wine gets its color from skin contact. We call that process maceration. But maceration, take red wine grapes, crush these berries, let the white grape juice inside of those berries sit with the red grape skins for an extended period of time. This is usually a week or 10 days. During that time, that white juice is just extracting color, structure, tannin, juice pulls body by being in contact with its grape skins. Now, if you take that opportunity away, that's when you've made yourself a rosé. So this rosé was made by the direct press method. I took red Sangiovese wine grapes. Mm -hmm. I pressed these berries uh, and we have a machine, it's called a press. So that is, it's one job. That's the job. So we took these grapes, pressed the machine, or pressed the grapes, evacuated all of the juice from inside of those berries, worked with the juice exclusively, then we just threw the grape skins away. So it pulled a little bit of color. You see that light yeah. pink color? Yeah. Pulled some color because that physical pressing process, that's a violent process. Right. right. And that's juice being forced through the skin. So it picks up a little bit of color, okay. but not very much. And you also, mm -hmm. you're not picking up as much color. You're not picking up as much body, as much structure, which makes it so easy to drink on a hot day because it's lighter yeah. and more refreshing chemically. Mm -hmm. Yes. And um, I, I think it's perfect. 
Yep. That's a very cool explanation. And that right there, ladies and gentlemen, is a preview of why you know now why I invited this guy to be yes. uh, to be a, a, on this podcast. Cause he knows his stuff. Yeah. So cheers. I'll drink to that. Cheers. Man. Indeed. Cheers. I need action. Yeah. Yeah. You need, get, yeah. I, I drank mine way too fast. You, you, you need a top I, off. Let me give you a... This will be the yeah, I, uh, We'll be talk about this in a second. I'm an All amateur, right. man. I, I just like chugged it. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta savor it, Ryan. <laughs> All right. So back to the topic at hand. Um, yeah, yeah. Basically, the last five minutes of you talking really got me thinking is mm -hmm. winemaking a science or an art? Ooh, healthy dose of both. Yeah. Um, you know, right now, I think there are 543 wineries in Texas, mm -hmm. or at least winery permits. And the, in Texas, that's the, the G permit through the TABC. But there are, there are over 500. Uh, G permitted wineries in Texas. What does G permitted mean? So the G permit is just the winery permit. Okay. The okay. ability to manufacture and sell wine okay. is uh, encompassing under that permit. But um, whether it's an art or a science, uh, it is definitely both. So all of those wineries were all doing something just a little bit different. Mm -hmm. You know, there is winemaking by number. There are, you have the ability to purchase uh, juice from California package it and share that under the, the G permit license in Texas. Mm -hmm. You have the ability to buy grapes from a local vineyard, process those grapes, turn them into a wine, package them, sell them to people. Um, and that's the business side of it. And that's definitely numbers. However, you want to conduct business, that's your business. Mm -hmm. um, the artistry, I think when you roll into the cellar, you're actually in a winery and you're around barrels. That's when you start needing to make some decisions. Now there are numbers. There's things that we have on hand so I've measured all of these wines for alcohol. I've measured mm -hmm. all of these wines for, for sugar. I've measured all these wines for acidity. Right. Um, when you're making a wine, you're looking for a balance between three things, alcohol, acidity, and tannin. Mm -hmm. If you're making a sweet wine, sugar would be a fourth component. Okay. But alcohol, acidity, and tannin, those three things, they better be in harmony in order for a wine to come across as pleasant. If any one of those things is out of whack, the wine will just feel wrong mm -hmm. on right. your palate. And those things are all quantifiable. You can find a number and adjust those things uh, to meet your, well, your desired wine. Mm -hmm. You know, even little things like I chose to make this a rosé. Mm -hmm. yeah. This rosé is 12% alcohol based off of when I harvested those grapes. This is the same grape. This is a red wine Sangiovese we're tasting in a second. Mm -hmm. It is 14% alcohol. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. there's lots of things at play. Um, and you can adjust those things. Here's where this style of winemaking becomes really different. So winemaking with no additives, it is entirely based on how the fruit comes out of that vineyard. Right. So going back to the alcohol discussion, as a, as a grape hangs in a vineyard, it's building sugars because this is ripening. You know, if you ever say someone, if someone ever says, oh, this was harvested overripe, that means it's probably really big, really high alcohol because it built so much sugar over yeah. time. And the first thing that happens with wine is fermentation. Sure. Fermentation, yeast eats sugars in grape juice, turns that sugar into alcohol. Mm -hmm. This is how all alcohol on this planet is created, is through mm -hmm. fermentation. And right now there are labs in Italy, uh, France, California, New Braunfels, Texas. There's a yeast no lab. No kidding. Yeah, and what these labs are doing, they will isolate and cultivate various naturally occurring yeast strains that are capable of doing different things to wine. So if you flip through the catalog from a yeast company, You'll see some yeast that's advertised as being able to take your wine this direction. Mm -hmm. You keep flipping through that catalog, some other yeast is advertised as being able to do this to your wine. Mm -hmm. As a winemaker, this is the first thing that you can control. So what yeast you buy, you add that yeast to your grape juice, that yeast eats the sugars in your grape juice, that yeast effectively makes your wine. Mm -hmm. That's a very beautiful, powerful, scientific thing. For us, I don't add anything, right. including yeast. Mm -hmm. So all of these wines, they ferment spontaneously using ambient yeast. There's yeast everywhere. There's yeast sure. on your forearm. There's yeast in the <laughs> air. There's yeast alive in vineyards right now, living right. on grapes. Right. And yeah. what I like to think is by making wines like this, maybe all of these wines are fermented by that yeast right. that came out of the vineyard on the grapes themselves. Right. In the French, they have this beautiful word, terroir. Terroir is T-E-R-R-O-I-R. Terroir does not have a direct translation from French to English, but I asked a French winemaker one time, I said, what does terroir mean to you? And she said terroir is when a wine takes on the energy of a place. And mm. I love that, man. Yeah. So, so Very much poetic. Of, yeah, yeah, so much of what I am doing here, I'm trying to get out of the grape's way, let the grape yeah. do the talking. And maybe right. these wines can better express their vineyard's energy or their vineyard's terroir. That excites me. And I think that that is a form of artistry. Granted, 
I, when you are fermenting spontaneously, you're giving up a lot of control. There's a lot of bad things that can happen. Mm -hmm. And I monitor right. those things very closely. Yeah. I'm smelling and tasting the wine every step of the way to make sure that there's not some harmful bacteria or harmful yeast that's making my wine smell or taste bad. You know, you hear right. harmful bacteria, there's a lot of negative connotations. There's nothing that can grow in wine that can hurt your body. Right. So wine cannot carry um, like a foodborne illness. It, mm. The reason wine was consumed so prolifically thousands of years ago is because the wine could not have been contaminated, uh, whereas the water might right. have been. Right. So right. when I say bad bacteria, it's purely stuff that makes wine smell or taste bad. Right. So I'm monitoring for that, which I think is science. Mm -hmm. The uh, spontaneous fermentation could quite possibly be art, or maybe it's just stupid. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> Dumb I had luck. a I know, right. <laughs> but I had a I had a friend one time. We were harvesting grapes. It was it was one in the morning, uh -huh. and. Uh, that's generally when we like to harvest in Texas. You try to harvest when it's cool outside. Because it's cool, yeah. And uh, he looked at me, and he knows how I make wine, and he likes our wines. And he said, Henry, you know you can out-science terroir. And I was like, oh, okay. More power to you. And I think right. that's another beautiful thing about wine. Going back to all these wineries in Texas, yeah. it is definitely part science, part art. Everybody's doing something a right. little bit differently. There mm -hmm. is no right or wrong way. The only way you can tell a good wine from a bad wine is whether or not you want another glass. Yeah, mm -hmm. so, that's it. So this is actually pretty interesting because uh, my my thing is, I've always asked people, what's the I, I can't tell the difference between like an expensive wine and a cheaper yeah. wine. I just can't tell. But one thing I will say right now, um, I don't know the price on this, but this one right here that you served me um, has a really interesting flavor. Yeah, like I, I can't. I, it almost tastes like an IPA beer. Ooh, kind of. Um, but it's obviously not. So that's really crazy. I don't know that what it is, is. I don't know what that you did is to a, this one. A, but I can see, Close I can back, taste yeah. the difference, though. I, I definitely taste the difference, which for me, that's what I tell everybody, all my friends that drink wine, I'm like, I can't taste the difference between, you know, expensive or non-expensive. Sure. I, I really can't taste the difference. But this one right here, not only looks different because it looks a little cloudy like you were mentioning, mm -hmm. but, but also um, it tastes different for me. I've never tried one like this. This, uh, and it's a unique grape. So this is 100% Malvasia Bianca. Now, we've okay. heard of Sangiovese. It's the king of Italian grapes. Um, Malvasia Bianca is originally from Croatia. Right oh. now, it grows most famously to make dessert wines. So a proper dessert wine is a high alcohol sweet wine, uh, usually made in Portugal or on the islands of Madeira. Mm -hmm. This is one of the four primary grapes used to make Madeira-style wine. Uh, really, really cool history for Malvasia Bianca. I love it for making this dry still. And when I say dry wine, it's a wine that's absent of sugar. So the yeast ate all the sugar, created as much alcohol as possible. So mm -hmm. a dry still, so not sparkling, white wine. And it is incredibly unique. It's um, very unique. Yeah, this is, uh, <laughs> this is actually, Malvasia Bianca is probably our most popular wine. And again, this, this has not yet been released uh, this summer either. We're looking at releasing it uh, the first weekend in July. Wow. But um, this wine... When we were, we made the first vintage of Malvasia Bianca in 2017. Right. 2017, we did three barrels of this wine. And uh, my partner in this endeavor is my dad. Uh, so nice. dad, dad and I are doing this together. And we bottled that 2017 Malvasia in uh, April 2018. We bottled, so right before we opened the tasting room. Sure. And we bottled all of it by hand using a hand corker, like forcing the cork in the bottle. Yeah, I think you showed me. It was, I it was a me miserable device. experience. Yeah. I, and what was most frustrating about that the entire time I was tasting this wine, I was like, man, uh, we're going to go out of business. This, this is the worst <laughs> thing not, I've ever put I'm in my not mouth. Getting it. I know. I, I, I hated it. <laughs> and then we released the wine, and like within three months, several articles had been written about it. It was the only, only. It was a very well-respected wine, that 2017 Malvasia. Yeah. 2018, I was like, well, maybe we just, something happened in 2017. 2018, it was just as cool. 2019, I'm, I'm super excited about this wine. Um, so this is one of your new this releases? Is, yes, this yeah. will be okay. out this uh, Next weekend. weekend in July, yeah. All right. But um, this Malvasia Bianca, that is very much the grape. Okay. Um, and I think that idea of terroir, there's a large part of that as well. Every year that I've worked with Malvasia Bianca, it's come from Nara Vineyards, Brownfield, Texas. And Nara is actually where the Sangiovese came from as well. And I think there's a minerality that these two wines share that I think mm -hmm. is quite lovely. Minerality, almost there's a, a, a beautiful drying sensation that just leaves you wanting more. Mm -hmm. um, and that vineyard seems to provide that. Uh, that vineyard is farmed by uh, 
lady named Nikila Nara. She's a really, really dear friend of mine. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I like to work with, I like to work with my buddies. Right. Yeah. And, uh, she definitely hadn't let us down on the, that's the mall to see it. It's been, I don't know. It's, it's been nice. special. What, what yeah. The IPA, like yeah, it's, so, so many of my buddies, I mean, this body was not built for wine. <laughs> this is, this is a beer drinker's body. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, uh, so many of my buddies are in the, in the, brewing industry yeah. beer industry and uh this is where they lean very yeah, aggressively because of what you picked up on yeah There's right away hoppy like, oh. citrus component yeah and, um yeah what do you think james i haven't tasted yet i was going to use this as an opportunity for walk us through the steps of somebody when they're tasting a wine okay what is what's yes. step number what's the first thing that they should do because you probably picked up on that ipa smell mm -hmm. before you even tasted yes. it yeah. Because I just smelled it, and I smelled exactly what you were talking yeah. about. Yeah, we call that so, the power of suggestion. Well, that yeah, yeah that yeah, probably had something so, to do yeah, with it. Yeah, someone someone says something like that, they can directly impact you. In fact, when yeah. I do when I do tastings in our tasting room, I do my damnedest not to provoke you any one way or another, give you a right. chance, and then sure. and then I try to talk with you about what I experienced. Because again, it is very personal. Right. Um, but when you're tasting wine, you know you see people doing this. Uh -huh. All right, so swirling I've been your doing wine glass, kind yeah. of out of habit. Yeah, yeah. The last couple times. first of all, it's fun. Yeah, um, it is. Second of all, but what you're yeah, you're changing the chemical structure of this wine in your okay. glass in real time. All right. So wine is one one of the things that impacts wine the most is oxygen. Got to do it and with my right doing, hand. Yeah, right, hand. right. I can't do it with the left. Yeah. When you're adding oxygen to your wine in your glass, you're you're changing how that wine tastes. I've actually done this at home. If you take two glasses of wine, take a bottle. Pour wine in one glass and just leave it sitting there. Mm -hmm. Pour wine in an adjacent glass, same wine, and drink Swirl out of that it. one. Swirl that one, drink out of it. And after maybe 10 minutes or 20 minutes of drinking the one that you've been adding oxygen to, yeah. revisit this cat uh -huh. and see how different it is. What oxygen does, oxygen, uh, we talked earlier about some of the biggest compounds in wine, alcohol, acid, and tannin. Mm -hmm. Tannin is what drives your mouth out when you drink those big heavy reds. Mm -hmm. that All right that sensation. Yeah. So yep. all wines have tannin. Tannin is composed of amino acid chains. Mm -hmm. If you add oxygen to these amino acid chains, they elongate and they soften. So barrel or barrels, <laughs> so oxygen barrels. That's why we use barrels. They breathe. Right. They allow right. oxygen to slowly enter the wine. But when you add oxygen in your glass, you're softening those amino acid chains. If you ever see people who buy one of those really big Napa Valley Cabernet Sauvignon and they're like, we're going to decant this. That's uh -huh. science. You know, part of it's aesthetic as well. Again, sure. wine is only as good as the experience associated with it. If you pour a big bottle of wine in a big, beautiful decanter, that's kind of sexy. It makes it taste better, right? Right. Um, but you're adding oxygen to that wine by decanting that wine, mm -hmm. which does make it feel more approachable and softer on your palate. And it does release aromatic compounds and esters to help make this wine what it is. So you're, you're adding oxygen to the wine. You taste it. You always smell it first, quite certainly. If you smell a wine and it smells damaged in any way don't drink it <laughs> treat, treat yourself better than that. Get yeah better. you know you can you can make it make a cocktail out of it you can sure. do something with it but, right uh you know i encourage you not to force something down your throat just because you've bought it you know right, right. And make sure you enjoy it and i think even here like in texas we're these wines they can change and i use natural cork there's a chance that you could get a cork bottle cork mm -hmm. Cork taint is a TCA, trichloroanisole, and TCA makes wine smell like a wet newspaper. You know, if you ever go to a restaurant and the server presents a bottle of wine that you've ordered and gives you just a quick little shot of it, that is your chance to smell it for cork taint. Mm -hmm. And you mm -hmm. smell it, if it has that wet newspaper smell, that's when you say, hey, I think this bottle might be flawed. Mm -hmm. And um, okay. so smell it first, see, address it for potential flaws. And then uh, from there, it's a... A journey, cool. right? Yeah. So yeah. smell it, taste it, go back. The interplay between your palate and your nose is incredible. Yeah. Right. The last number I heard is like you 73% of everything you taste is what you smell. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. So that's huge, you know. Yeah. So you tried it? I did. Not to put you in the spot, but what do you think? I, I like it. It's it's um, it's different than what I normally what drink. To, yeah. Because uh, sure. cause normally uh, at our house, we're, we're always drinking reds. Like that's, yeah. that's our favorite go-to. Um, and so we rarely get to, to drink whites. There's very few whites that I've ever enjoyed. Mm -hmm. Um, and the bulk of the ones that I've enjoyed have been from your winery. Yep. And, uh, so w when my wife and I have, have come out to visit you, I think we've been out there like three or four times when we come to visit, we're always, we're, we're like, Hey, whatever you're serving, we're going to, 
Yeah. We're, we're going to toss it back yeah, because we know it's going to be yeah. good. And so, yeah, this one, this one is, it's, it's definitely, uh, it's definitely a lot more tart and a lot more citrusy than the rosé mm-hmm. was. Mm-hmm. A, lot, a little more acid heavy. Lo- very um, acid heavy. Yeah. I, yeah, it's, um, it's a cool little, these two wines are a cool little journey and the way that, the way that you set up a wine tasting, that's entirely up to the winemaker. A lot of people mm-hmm. would start with white wine mm-hmm. and then go into rosé. Oh, yeah. I like to get the, get the little rosé and, mm-hmm. and then, um, start progressing in that trip direction um yeah yeah it's one of the things that we do with our white and rosé wines which may um be pleasing to your palate uh we actually do barrel age mm-hmm. all of our wines including the white no stainless and rose, no stainless steel so okay. most winemakers would uh allow their wine their white and rosé wines to exist their entire lives in a stainless steel tank and stainless mm-hmm. steel is an incredibly beautiful and powerful thing that promotes no oxygen transfer whatsoever so it you put wine in that tank and it exists. It's there. It keeps right. it very secure. Now barrels, barrels promote something a little more dynamic. Again, mm-hmm. barrels breathe. They function like a right. like a permeable membrane. They allow oxygen in and they allow oxygen out. When oxygen comes into contact with wine, it changes the structure of that wine. And in a barrel, that happens at a very micro level slowly over time. So you see wines that might be advertised as being aged two years in a barrel. Mm-hmm. Well, they did that to soften that wine because when they first put it in the barrel, it was probably a giant tannic monster. You leave yeah. it in a barrel and that tannin softens as a result of those amino acid chains uh, elongating. But having barrel aged our white and rosé wines, they do create something that feels fuller, feels mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. softer and more approachable. Rounder is a really good word. They're, they're very contemplative examples of white yeah. and rosé wine. Uh, good, good introductory for primary red wine drinkers to get into white and rosé mm-hmm. is a good yeah. little pathway. Yeah, I think I'm, I'm kind of a creature of habit. I, I I think when I go to a place, I usually go for one thing, and, and I feel like this is probably going to be the, the one for me. Like, I, I, yeah. I really think this is very different from what I've tasted. Oh, yeah. You have and, impeccable uh, taste. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what, what's interesting to me is how uh, you were talking about the whole process of aerating and decanting a wine mm-hmm. b- before you drink it. Um, and we, we do that with uh, a, a couple different ways. We have a, deca- a big fancy decanter yep. that we'll bring up for special occasions. But most of the time, we just use one of those little bobbles that you just pop into the top of the cork and it, it does does the job for you. Yeah. What really fascinates me is how you can have, out of, out of your out, even in your first glass, how the structure and the taste and the, and the aroma can change from the first sip to the last sip of the first glass. Yeah. Even yes. where you yeah. get, you can tell right away when, uh, cause we, we both, both my wife and I know like, Oh, we need to let this one sit just a little bit. Yep. Mm-hmm. Let it open up and in 10 minutes we'll come back to it. Exactly. And That's been it's my experience right now. Changed. Yeah, yeah. When I first started to when I finished it, it was, it, it felt a little different, but yeah. in a good way though. Oh yeah. And yeah. I think, uh, again, with wine, you can't be wrong. It's very personal. This is supposed to be fun. You know, if you're not having fun doing yeah, it, you're, you're, doing, you're it wrong. doing it wrong. Yeah. yeah. So if you if you don't want to have a thoughtful, contemplative glass of wine, by mm-hmm. all means, pour your wine in a glass and sit down and enjoy it. Yeah. Right, you know, right. You don't have to get too deep into how it changed from the first sip to the last sip. Sure. Um, you know, I tend to do that at home a lot, tasting with intent. Mm-hmm. Uh, because for me, constantly trying to learn. Um, right. read about this report that came out. This guy who studied um, the brain, he took uh, a casual wine consumer mm-hmm. adjacent to a wine industry professional, took a really nice bottle of wine and poured for them a glass of this nice bottle of wine and had their brains wired to see exactly what parts of their brain were, were firing. Right. And uh, the casual consumer poured them a nice glass of wine and the pleasure center of their brain was lighting up. A uh, really, really cool thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The... Wine industry professional, the analytical side of their brain oh, sure. is lighting up. So once mm-hmm. you get more and more into wine, it's fascinating to, to realize that it changes the way that you drink. Mm-hmm. And right. that has quite certainly happened uh, to me. One of the one of the guys that taught me how to make wine, his go to drink is absolute vodka. Really? Yeah, yeah. It's just it's a thoughtless beverage. Yeah, vodka, right, right. You know, it's delicious. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. But something that doesn't force that, it's something you can just relax with. Yeah. yeah. And that's interesting. But, you know, in, enjoy wine however you feel most comfortable. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's funny because like that's kind of how I have my opinion on it is like, I figured at some point I would mature. Because <laughs> right now, <laughs> I'm kind of like a light drinker, like Bud Light. You know, I'm pretty easy, pretty easy.
pretty cheap date. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I've always I, I've always had the interest in wine because mm-hmm. I'm actually originally from Michigan, and so there's there's some wineries out there, yeah, um, yeah. some pretty good ones. But again, I, I didn't know the difference because I, I feel like I, you know back then it was just like, I just want to get drunk, you know, and uh, I didn't yeah. really care about flavors and things like that. But now as I get older, I'm like. Yeah, I kind of want to have fun and kind of think about, you know, like now I have yeah. a lot more thought process when I when I drink like things like this. Three months before I uh, took my wife wine tasting for the first time, we went to a wine mixer when we were in college. And we were in college, so we were just flush with cash. So we cruised into this wine mixer with two boxes of Franzia, <laughs> which <laughs> empirically, this is not a good product, man. Right. But that <laughs> night, that wine was singing, you know, and yeah. we were pretty much drinking it straight out of the bag. Um <laughs> But I've never forgotten that, and I think yeah. there there is steps in a, yeah. in your there's progression. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Yeah. And there's, you know, my experience is not right or wrong or right. it's just different. Yeah, you know, and I yeah. think uh, it's everybody that, that yeah. matters. Yeah, and th- that we've had the same kind of progression. Uh, my wife and I have. I was not a, a very big connoisseur of of wine to any degree before. Uh, before my wife and I started getting together, or before we got together, and. Um, then we just on a on a whim just for something to do we started traveling out to Dripping Springs and and going to wineries there and then going a little further all the way into Fredericksburg and and stopping at a couple of places and just meeting folks like yourself who are like you are you are very passionate about making wine and about um, in educating folks on how to enjoy wine and we just met more and more people like you and and started learning more and more about it. And the more that we tasted, the more that we were like, okay, I'm, I'm picking up what these guys are throwing down. And it became a much more enjoyable experience. And, and as you've been saying all along, it, it really is about, uh, and has been about the experience, not about getting sloshed, yes. but about enjoying all the different flavors and the complexity that you have in, out, of the, out of the same bottle from start to yeah. finish. Yeah, it's a, it's a social drink. Even the bottle size that is used for wine, this is a 750 milliliter bottle. Right. So a serving of wine is five ounces. Mm -hmm. This is 25 ounces. So this is five servings of wine. Now your portion size might be more than five ounces. That's fine. But it's typically is in our household. Right, right. (laughs) Uh, But there's five servings in a bottle of wine. And we just talked about how oxygen changes wine over time. Oxygen will ruin wine. So when you pull the cork on a bottle of wine, that's when you need to have your teammates with you. you Can know, I hurry up? Sitting there <laughs> drinking it. You know, I, I love drink. I mean, going back to my wife, love drinking wine with my wife. And we have a policy in our house. We never finish a bottle the day that we open it. Really? So we don't stop drinking. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> if, we're, if we decide to drink wine that night, got a lot we're of drinking around. wine that night. Yeah, we might have two or three bottles open, but we always leave at least two glasses left in the bottom of that bottle so that we can revisit that wine the next day and see how it changed. Again, this goes okay. back to the analytical side of tasting wine. I want to know exactly what oxygen is going to do to that wine over a 24 hour period. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's super, yeah. super fun, but it's a social drink meant to be shared with at least one other person. Mm-hmm. And I've, yeah. I've drank bottles of wine on my own before and it's just not the same. Right. Yeah. I can see, I can definitely see that Yeah, for sure. So what's this, uh, what's this next? We've got our first red. Yeah. So this is Malbec. Oh, I love Malbec. Man. Me I'm too. excited. So Malbec, this is a, uh, it's one of the grapes in Bordeaux. So Bordeaux, yeah. Western France, most famous grape out of Bordeaux would be Cabernet Sauvignon. Of course. And you have Merlot, uh, Petit Verdot, Cab Franc, mm-hmm. and Malbec. Now, right now in Argentina, they've really taken a hold of Malbec and made a, ask that. made a real home for it there. But it is originally French, originally from Bordeaux. Uh, I love it for Texas. The very first red wine I ever made under the Croson brand mm-hmm. was a Malbec from 2016. And this is from this is from Nara Vineyards as well. So these first three wines, and Nara Vineyards, it's in Brownfield, Texas, in the Texas High Plains. Right. If you go wine tasting on the highway, uh, you will notice that most of the wines come from the Texas High Plains. Yep. Right now, seventy three percent of the grapes in Texas are farmed in that region, uh, which means seventy three percent of the wines in Texas would be from, from the High Plains. Up there. And uh, when you head northwest through Texas. You eventually hit this beautiful geographical feature, the Yana Estacada. Yep. The Yana Estacada, the elevation goes up, then it's flat. Mm-hmm. So that's the Texas High Plains. Right about um, post Texas is where you right? where, where you hit that. That's ramp the spot, up. man. Yeah. yeah. The uh, it's and a really beautiful region for the growing of wine grapes. They have a higher elevation, right. high plains. That elevation promotes a drier, uh, promotes really cool environment for uh, for wine. Mm-hmm. This Malbec, this is a. Uh, 
This is actually brand new as well. This was released last Friday. Okay. Um, man, we're getting all the new it, stuff right yeah, now. Yeah, man. <laughs> VIP right here. Got you exactly. covered. I'll have to say just quickly, uh, mm-hmm. it smells amazing. Yeah. I mean, amazing. Cool. It's, so. well, I'll, I'll tell you what I think in a second, but what do you, what do you guys smell? What do you taste? What do you smell? Rob? No pressure, but there's a what? test at the end. What? I, I can't, oh, I gotta, I can't pinpoint right now. Okay. I've literally been trying to think about it's a spice, right? Is that what you're saying? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I smell a spice yeah. or something. So I'm getting um, I, blackberries. I, I, I got a little bit of that. I actually, for some reason, was getting a little bit of cinnamon, which I don't cinnamon. normally expect out of a Malbec. That's super cool. Yeah. yeah. I'm, not, I'm not really sure. <laughs> I'm not really sure what I smell. I, I smell yeah. some, but it's it's amazing. So yeah. when um when yeast is eating the sugars in grape juice and creating alcohol, so yeah. this, again, that's fermentation. Yeast is not just eating sugar and creating alcohol. Yeast is releasing all the esters and all the aromas that make wine what it is. So, so often, like for me, I smell blackberries here. You smell cinnamon. Right. I'll have people ask me in our tasting room, like, so at what point did you add cinnamon to the wine? Like, well, I didn't. I didn't add any cinnamon to this wine. This is all grapes. or It's just 100% Malbec grapes. But what happened during fermentation when that yeast was eating that sugar, it just so happened to release the aromatic compound that you would associate with cinnamon. Mm-hmm. And again, this is all very, very personal. I did a right. I did a wine tasting in Napa once, and this fellow, he poured for me a glass of Sauvignon Blanc. Mm-hmm. And he goes, Mr. Croson, you'll notice that this wine has the aromatics of freshly cut grass. Well, I grew up in East Texas, man. Yeah. I mowed my lawn every <laughs> Saturday. It was always hot and humid outside, and I smelled that wine. I was like, holy smokes, this guy's figured out wine. He's a genius, right? Uh, the gentleman next to me leans over and goes, Hey man, what's he talking about? I don't smell any grass in this. Well, this guy grew up in southern New Mexico. Now he mowed his lawn, uh-huh. but it was never humid. It was always dry. Right. He didn't yeah. pick up on that that moist, freshly cut grass sensation. Yeah. It was not possible for him to perceive that. Right. Um, wow. First first Malbec I ever made. Our tasting room had been open for maybe a month, so we were just getting started, and I was having the time of my life, quite mm-hmm. frankly, uh, sharing my wines for the first time in my tasting room. And uh, this this lady comes in. I had, at the time, our menu consisted of two rosés, 2016 rosé, 2017 rosé, mm-hmm. and two Malbecs. Mm-hmm. A Malbec aged in oak barrels and a Malbec aged in a concrete wine tank. Mm-hmm. In concrete, it's been used in winemaking since the, the times of Ancient Romans, the Romans invented concrete for the purposes of the aqueduct system. Mm-hmm. And then they had this new formable material. They were like, let's put some wine in it. So they were the first people to age <laughs> wine in concrete. Concrete, it does not breathe like a barrel, but it is porous. Right. So when that concrete vessel is empty, oxygen rushes inside and fills those pores. Then you put a wine inside of it. Slowly over time, the oxygen that's trapped inside those pores makes its way into the wine, changes the structure of that wine in much the same way that a barrel would but to a significantly lesser degree. So all the aromas and all the flavors, they come about just, just a touch differently. And I always really dug that. But that was our tasting mm-hmm. at the time. Mm-hmm. Two rosé, side-by-side comparison, right. two Malbec. Really cool side-by-side comparison. Mm-hmm. And lady comes in, and she's tasting through the wines. She gets to the oak-aged Malbec, which at the time was my pride and joy. And sure. uh, yeah. she, she smelled it, and she goes, man, this wine smells like fermented fish. And I was just devastated. I know. I was, I was so sad. i just gotten done saying how what you smell and what you taste in a glass of wine is not wrong. You can't be wrong. And then she says this. And I was, I almost said, ma'am, you're wrong. You need to leave. But I didn't. It was fine. <laughs> it's a good thing. I know. And she uh, finished the tasting. That was by far her favorite wine. And she took home several bottles. The one bottles. that smelled like yeah. fermented fish. So, again, whatever her association yeah. was with fermented fish was a powerful one. And yeah. she, like, not a single person in the next two years worth of wine tastings that I've done in that building have said anything remotely close to that about any of our wines. Yeah. That just goes to show wine tasting is so personal. And mm-hmm. I, yeah, it is. And I was going to say too, um, I was kind of a little embarrassed to say it earlier, but I kind of smelled like kind of clove, like you mentioned, you mentioned yeah. spice and I smelled that was cloves. In there. I'm kind what, of a, what was clove to you was might've been cinnamon to me. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, uh, you know, went to high school with a bunch of hippies, so we <laughs> smoke cloves the, all the time. There, uh, there it is. But yeah, I kind of smelled cloves, and I was like, eh, I don't know if I should say this because I'm going to look kind of dumb. But uh, yeah. I think it is kind of a personal thing. I don't think it smells like cloves, it's maybe, personal. but you it's something that wrong. hits me. And that right there is an explanation, uh, is a perfect explanation of why so many people are so tight-lipped about when they go to a tasting, they're like, mm-hmm. 
I don't want to tell you what I'm tasting in case I'm wrong or what yeah. I'm smelling in case I'm wrong. You tell me what I'm supposed to be tasting. So let's talk about that for a second. Mm-hmm. So how do you disarm your your uh, the folks that come to, come into your tasting room? How do you disarm them to really get them to open up other than just feeding them more wine? Like what, what's the what's the trick? The very first thing that we do, our tasting room feels like a living room. It does. Yeah. So you walk in, we do all of our tastings seated at a table and we have the bottles open just like this. You know, a lot of winers will use a pour spout, which allows you to really control the flow of the wine, control the portion size quite possibly. That to me is the anti-sexy. So we, we have (laughs) our bottles just, just like you would at home. You know, there's always going to be a little bit of spillage down the front of the bottle that I think ends up looking so stinking cool. It's like its own little piece of art here. Um, but to create a familial environment right off the bat, like you're at someone's house visiting a friend is what we really try to strive for. That matters to me. Mm-hmm. So that's immediately disarming. Yeah. And, you know, my personality, I make, I make pretty serious wine, but I do not take myself seriously. Yeah. I mean, I spilled coffee on my shirt. On the way over. <laughs> I, it, I was going to say something, but I, <laughs> yeah, no, you, I, you look like a winemaker. Well, it's filming. You know, it's, yeah, I yeah, need to good. acknowledge it before my wife gets mad at me. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I... I I, it is supposed to be fun. And I mm-hmm. think highlighting that as often as possible in our tasting room makes it feel that much more comfortable. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, you know, especially as Americans, we are so, there's a pride factor involved. It's hard to ask questions. It is. It's hard yeah. to acknowledge, I don't know something, you might. Let me give right. you the power Help here. Me figure and this yeah, out. you know, yeah. it's really, really hard to ask questions. But that's, we that's can, probably why I haven't been to a wine wine tasting because I'm, I'm kind of intimidated by the, the whole culture of it. You know, like, yeah. I, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm going to say something really dumb and yeah. ask for like the cheapest one or I don't know. I have no idea. And, there, and so I, I definitely am intimidated by that. There's yeah. a lot of people that can make wine uncomfortable and that's, yeah. mm-hmm. that's super unfortunate. Um, I think f- go, you know, go wine tasting. Mm-hmm. So find spots that do make you feel comfortable. And again, this, this is all recommendation based, right? Mm-hmm. You ask your buddies, people that you're already comfortable with what they like from there. You can expand your own horizons. Yeah. I always tell people drink or other winemakers drink. Obviously, yeah. we feel comfortable there. You know, I've got my my list of wineries where it's like this is this is where I like to hang out, and I I think that you guys might like it too, and that carries a whole lot of weight. So never be afraid to ask for recommendations on where to go mm-hmm. for that disarming experience. Mm-hmm. But I think just creating an environment of comfort. Mm-hmm. You know, I I mentioned Napa earlier. You know, the guy in Napa that was pouring wine for me, he was wearing a suit, which is a beautiful thing. He's a good looking cat wearing a suit with a tie. And that is not comfortable for me. As in, I yeah. think at the time I was wearing shorts and a t-shirt, you know? <laughs> yeah. And right. I, so like that, that was tough. I, I started yeah. that first summer. Um, when we, when we opened our tasting room, I always wanted to wear a button down jeans and boots. Mm-hmm. You know, that's typically how I dress when I'm dressing up. Um, <laughs> but there were a couple of times where I would be working in the cellar, working with the wine and I'd be wearing flip flops, shorts and a t-shirt and someone would call for an appointment. We do all of our tastings by appointment, which again, allows me to control the comfort level. If there's mm-hmm. 20 people that show up at one time, yeah. that's not cozy. No. So we right. try to maintain the flow of people coming into the room. And uh, I started tracking the sales from when I was wearing shorts and a t-shirt versus when I was wearing jeans and a button down. Mm-hmm. We sold more wine when I was wearing shorts and a t-shirt. Well, uh, I mean, you're talking uh, about central, uh, central Texas. Exactly. Uh, that's, a, that's the uniform for, uh, for Austin comfort level it um uh, that creates that cool little environment makes makes wine a little more approachable absolutely this this is sangiovese so this is the same grape that you used for the first rosé that we were trying mm-hmm. just processed well not i shouldn't say processed just process is good yeah. process is yeah, okay so we went through okay. a different process so this was a direct press method rosé with no skin contact right this i harvested sangiovese grapes crushed these berries, had the white grape juice sitting with red grape skins for about 10 days. Uh-huh. Now, during that time, that juice, it was pulling color, structure, tannin. It became this this deep red color. It, uh, well, what do you smell? What do you taste? I'm still Let's find out. Yeah. Now, this one, um, I mean, I am... In no way about to take my exam to become a sommelier, but this one <laughs> fermented a hundred percent. I w- I would if you had put this in front of me and not told me what it was, I would have said that's a San Giovese. It smells every bit of it. That's awesome. Yeah, that's really really cool. So we call that varietal character. Mm-hmm. Um, so a type of grape would be a variety, 
And uh, if a wine has what's considered varietal character, that means it smells like what it's supposed to. Right. And yep. a lot of times our wines don't do well in that category because we are not adjusting the sugars in the wine or adjusting the uh, acid level. And we're fermenting with spontaneous yeast. But every once in a while, um, we do have a wine that smells exactly like the grape yeah. that's used to make it. I would say this one is one of the, yeah. Mm -hmm. that, that it, it smells, tastes just like it smells. Yeah. For sure. The, um, so Chianti would be a good example of, of Sangiovese. Um, mm. well, that's Brunello good. de yeah. Montalcino would be a good Italian Sangiovese. I'm just yeah. enjoying myself. Oh, yeah. This is really Absolutely. Good. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's actually kind of, it is fun to, to drink and then talk about it and yeah. in my head just kind of figure out what I'm smelling and tasting. It's 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 really fun. Absolutely yeah. enjoyable. Yeah, I think uh, uh, my, uh, Delana and I are going to are going to be coming by and, and, yeah, uh, and picking up a, bo a bottle or two of this. She's probably mad at you right she, now. Oh, man. I'm sure yeah, she is. Yeah. I mean, when I told her who I was interviewing today, she was like, thank it." <laughs> <laughs> my uh, my wife asked me, she goes, so you think I could come? I was like, I, I don't know what the. Yeah. Uh, Vibe will be better. absolutely. I think she might well, with your next pre, with your yeah. next pre release, we'll have you back on and yeah, right. bring Amy with you, and yeah. we'll just have a grand old time. <laughs> Good, yeah, man. She's uh she's fun to have around too because if she doesn't like something I made, she tells me. <laughs> so it'd be great well, to she's have, she's great to have her she's do that in the public. Yeah. yeah, that'd be a fun episode to all bring our spouses. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like everyone bring our and we just yeah, it'd be a lot of fun. It all would. Right. I think so. We'll call it "Honey Criticize My Work." Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that'll be the the, the episode title. Yeah. Okay. So Sangiovese, this to me, it's less fruit and more earth tones. This the, to me is yes. leather shop and tobacco. Yeah. It's going to say I think it feels like, excuse me, it feels a little less sweet. Mm -hmm. But not in a bad way. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Like, yep. I, I'm really into earthy. It's a little, uh, going back it's got to a, high it's got a little years, bit more. Yeah. Certainly yeah. less perceivably sweet. Yeah. You know, when you look at something like a Malbec, where to me the predominant flavor would be blackberries. Mm -hmm. Well, blackberries are sweet. You know, yeah. fruits mm -hmm. are sweet. Yeah. You get into these earth tones. I don't know. I got a little, a little, a little bit more wood. Uh, yeah. yeah de definitely a little bit more. Um, I don't know exactly which wood. I want to say hickory, but I'm. Don't know if that was accurate, but <laughs> it sounded really I, good. I, def, I definitely, definitely had a, like I'm, uh, I'm envisioning myself standing over the grill, putting a putting yeah. a couple ribeyes on. Yeah, drinking this. Yeah. Heck yeah, yeah. I'm I'm much less of a sweet. I, I don't have a sweet tooth, so I, I like things that are more earthy and less sweet. So that's the. I, I think this is the direction sure. I lean as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, and sweet wine, you know, it certainly has a time and a place. We dessert. Mm -hmm. Yeah, dessert <laughs> wine much. is a good candidate. We, <laughs> I went to a. a a Christmas party with a bunch of winemakers and uh, oh, I bet that was fun. It was, <laughs> and we um, cruised in with with bottles. Everyone brought some wine. So I brought some some wines that I was excited to share, and then I also picked up a bottle of Boone's Farm Sangria flavor. <laughs> sangria flavor. And this is yeah, yeah. I, I thought it'd be hilarious, and it was. <laughs> and uh, cruised in, we, we all laughed, and we put the bottle in the freezer waited about 25 minutes and then we pulled it out and we started tasting this wine and had a buddy who leans over and he goes, I hate that. I don't hate this. <laughs> and I think you know, going back to the, uh, uh, wine is only as good as the experience yeah. surrounding it, man. Yeah. If you're having well, a good time, so sweet wine has a time and a yeah, place. No, I for think, sure. Um, I, actually, now you bring that sangria. Like, I mean, I'm Mexican, so we yeah. drink that a lot and you're right. It's yeah. definitely really, it goes against everything that I kind of <laughs> <laughs> drink and believe in. But yeah, I, I but if you're having fun with your career. family, yeah. yeah, you pour it over ice and yep. smile at each other and call it a day. No kidding. Um, <laughs> love that. That's cool. Now that was that was the epitome of what a what a Sangiovese typically text, tastes like. And even despite your resistance to filter it, mm -hmm. that was very very clean as far as the as far as the finish goes. For sure, and I think so. We fall under this umbrella, this natural wine umbrella. Mm -hmm. Natural wine is pretty in vogue right now. Uh, it's popular. Yeah. There's a lot of natural wine bars that are popping up all over the place. There is no definition for natural wine. Right. Uh, the best thing I've heard is that a wine is natural if it's spontaneously fermented, which we certainly fall under that umbrella, not adding commercially available yeast. France uh, just recently defined it, mm -hmm. and we actually don't even fall under their definition. They say natural wine needs to be made with uh, organic grapes. Well, we're in Texas. There is, mm -hmm. unfortunately, there is not an organic vineyard in Texas. Um, and even then, sometimes organic can be more marketing than 
than truth. Right. Like right. under organic. A little bit more subjective. Yeah, under organic protocols, you're allowed to spray your vineyard as often as you'd like with sulfur. And so right. let's say you have a tractor and you're on your tractor three times a week spraying with sulfur to inhibit bacteria growth on your grapes. And this bacteria growth, if you're in a humid environment like the Texas Hill Country, Humidity is moisture. Moisture promotes bacteria growth. Bacteria right. growth promotes rot, mold, and fungus. Right. So if you're in that environment, you can spray sulfur on your grapes, and it might keep those forces of evil at bay. However, you can do that as often as you want and still be classified as organic. But what if there's a systemic spray that is not organic that you can spray once every four weeks, and you're less time on the, the tractor. Think about the amount of diesel you're pumping into the environment, mm -hmm. the amount of sulfur you're spraying into the environment. Yeah. You're organic, but it's counterintuitive. You're not really right. good for the... So sometimes, the, but that's a whole other discussion, the organic discussion. Right. Right. There are no organic grapes in Texas okay. right now. However, in France, to be considered a natural wine, you need to have organic grapes, right. which is All interesting. Right. So we don't fall under that umbrella. But right now, America... It's okay. No definition for natural. Yeah. <laughs> no definition for natural wine, uh, but it is kind of universally agreed upon that if you use commercially available yeast, uh, uh it mm -hmm. needs to be fermented spontaneously. Mm -hmm. And sometimes with these wines, uh, these natural wines, you taste them and smell them, and they just feel wrong. Yeah, funky is a good word, and we've yeah. we've made some wines that definitely lean more toward funk. But earlier <laughs> you said clean. Mm -hmm. Our wines are very clean. Yeah, they. Uh, they're good wines empirically, whether or not they're fermented spontaneously. Right. And the reason I make wine like this is solely because I think it tastes better. Oh, yeah. You know, I, my biggest fear is that people will drive down the highway once they leave Johnson City and be like, man, the cat in Johnson City says you shouldn't filter or add sulfites. It's like, no, no, by all yeah. means, do those things if that suits your brand. Uh, for us, I'm simply choosing not to. However, mm -hmm. I don't want to make something funky. I want to make something that's clean and delicious, yeah. you know. So that clean, that's I appreciate that as a descriptor because that is something that in a, in this style of winemaking is hard. It's yeah. hard to make something clean when you're allowing wild yeast and wild bacteria get involved. Right. Yeah. So th this well, one's kind of airy. Very. Very airy. Kinda yeah. Of. You're that's on the good, Zinfandel, correct? That, that's a good description. What's that? The Zinfandel? Yeah. Is that the last one. Yeah. 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 Have I poured that for you as well? Yes. Yeah. Okay. That's what cool. I'm on. Yeah. I saw you guys pouring. I was like, wait, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> Got to catch up. Yeah, yeah, Very that, airy, that's a, like it kind of opened my nostrils when I mm -hmm. ah, kinda smelling it. It's uh, the, yeah, the I, I was just thinking about a, the uh, uh, about how how it had felt. I'm not going to use the term mouthfeel, but because <laughs> I I I cringe whenever I hear somebody talk really? about that. I'm like, seriously, just say, <laughs> yeah. you know what? When I took a sip, felt like it was a powder puff. I mean, it 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 kind of it does. That's a really good description, Raul. That it felt a little bit lighter, a little bit airy for especially for a red. Yeah. So um, a lot of that is because this is Infandel. It's fifteen percent alcohol. You talk about opening up your nostrils. Yeah, this will uh, take you places you didn't know you wanted to go. Yeah, that's <laughs> what I was gonna say too. It's very yeah. much more like I can smell the alcohol. Like it yeah. felt like there was more, but I wasn't sure yeah. because of my. So palate. a lot of times that can come across as perceivably hot, mm -hmm. and uh, even then, so in some circles that would be considered a flaw. When I smell this wine, I I don't necessarily get that heat sensation. This is a fruit bomb to me. It's like 15% mm. alcohol grape juice. Mm -hmm. mm. Um, but a really appropriate expression of Zinfandel, going back to that idea of varietal character. Yeah. I shared this with a buddy two days ago, and he goes, 15% alcohol? That's pretty light for a Zin. I was like, oh, Jesus. <laughs> but he's right, man. There's, there's Zinfandels in California that can really push the envelope of what a, yeah. what a pleasant, easy drink and wine yeah. can be. Right. Yeah. Uh, so Zinfandel is originally from Croatia, kind of like Malvasia Bianca. Now, the Italians have taken hold of it. In, in fact, in the 1800s, when a lot of Italians were immigrating to what is it, you know, America, right. they went to Northern California. You ever see a label on a bottle of wine that says Old Vine Zinfandel, Old Vine Zin? Yeah. yeah. Those are legitimately old vines. I've seen a Zinfandel vineyard that was planted in the 1880s. Wow. Which is super cool. And these vineyards were planted by these, these Italian immigrants. Um, so a really big part of American Viticulture. Zinfandel's mm -hmm. been here a long stinking time since pre-prohibition right. days. Uh, it was it was mistreated in the '90s uh, because of Behringer White Zinfandel. Yeah, White Zinfandel, very much a marketing term. White Zinfandel's a rosé. There is no White Zinfandel. Zinfandel's a red wine grape. Mm -hmm. uh, they just so happen to make it into a rosé format, and it is a touch sweet. Mm -hmm. And they laughed all the way to the bank. It, yeah, it's, sure. Uh, you know, white calling it White Zinfandel 
was brilliant in hindsight. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and I, again, full disclosure, I had some white Zinfandel in January and it was delicious. <laughs> yeah. so I, I, I was going to okay. say, you know, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I was going to ask you actually, cause I've only ever tried white Zinfandel mm -hmm. and, uh, I mean, yeah, I do like it, but is it actually, that's actually a little too sweet for me. I drink it just because my wife drinks it. Yeah. I'm, I, I feel like I'm more into like dry, not as sweet for sure. But yeah. this, this right now feels like something that I would probably drink with my buddies, like, because it feels like the alcohol levels mm -hmm. a lot higher. Yeah. And I normally drink to have fun. So, <laughs> yeah. And I think my, uh, uh, kind of going back to my wife, yeah, poured for her all the new wines and she, <laughs> she gets to the Zinvin though. She goes, Oh, I love this. Yeah. She looked at the back and looked at the alcohol content and she goes, Oh, that I can see why. Yeah. She's, <laughs> yeah. That's just for whatever reason, her palate leans that direction. Um, yeah. Which I think Somewhere. is cool. Again, that's why you go wine tasting. You got to find out what appeals yeah. to you. Mm -hmm. there, there is no right or wrong. It's all personal preference based. I tend to prefer lower alcohol wines, younger, fresher wines. Mm -hmm. Like these red wines were made in 2018. Uh, White and Rosé typically released the year following its production. Right. So these were made in the fall of 2019 and they're going to be released soon. Mm -hmm. These wines were made, oh, 19 months ago. And... Uh, I love the way they're drinking right now. Oh yeah. Whereas I'd, there is a segment of the population that would rather age them longer mm -hmm. and teach their own. So in, in our tasting room, I drink wines when I want to drink them. It's a very, right. this is all very selfish wine. It's what I like. <laughs> and if anyone sure. else likes it, that's gravy, but it really mattered to me kind of going back to the excitement and the passion behind it. Yeah. You know, I, if I'm not pouring something that I'm excited about, then I'm doing it wrong. Right. Yeah. Uh, so trying to create an environment where I enjoy it the most. Well, that's good though. All right. Yeah. I mean, that's good, though, you know, like, because we talk about, like, the difference between being creative and all that. Like, the artist, like, when they're ready to show you their piece, you know, that's what you want to enjoy. Right. So that, that's kind of cool, the too, reaction. that you mentioned that, because it's like, when you think it's ready to go, yeah. it's ready to go, you know? Or you see a piece of art, and you're like, it would look just as good Thank if you. it was flipped the other way around. Yeah. Like, no, the artist wanted it a certain way. A certain right. way, matters, yeah. You know? And so you want to enjoy that the way they... Mm -hmm. And wine's cool, like, you know, again, oxygen Thank and... Time changes things. I use natural corks. These cork, uh, these corks do contain oxygen, much like a concrete barrel. So earlier, concrete doesn't breathe; it doesn't allow oxygen to enter, but it does contain oxygen. Same with these corks. So these corks contain oxygen. You force this cork into a bottle of wine. Slowly over time, the oxygen inside of these corks make their way into the bottle of wine, continue to change the structure of that wine. Right. So I like that. We use these natural corks because these wines will grow and will develop. Again, for me personally, I like them young and fresh. But we have a lot of fans. I had uh, Today, this morning, a guy tasted wine with me, and he goes, man, I'm going to take some Malbec home, and I'm putting a date on the bottle. I'm drinking it in 2021. And I was like, awesome. Yeah. <laughs> That's super, super cool to see where people's personal preferences lie. Yeah. And again, the only way you can determine what you like is by drinking. Mm -hmm. drinking yeah, because yeah, I was, was going to ask, like uh, – what the cutoff date is or, you know, like how long it should be aged. But you just kind of answered that. Like, it just depends on when you drink it. And if you like that, it depends age, on what you like. And I think over time, the wine will fall off a cliff. Yeah. Too much oxygen exposure will damage it. I can vouch for that oh, okay. too. Mm -hmm. Okay. So as we, as we kind of wrap things up, um, let's talk about the, we've been talking a lot about what consumers will, uh, sh should learn from this, what they should take away from this. So if you were educating somebody new, which you do every, every, every yeah. week. Um, what would you say are the, the three most important questions that a, an average consumer should know about wine? Is it decide whether or not they like red or white or how to store it or how to prepare it? Or what, what, what are some of the, the what, what are the three most important criteria that a consumer should know about wine in order to begin getting into that more advanced stage of really enjoying it? Yeah. Yeah. You know, once you go and do a tasting, that creates a cool environment for you to make a decision on what you like and what you don't like. Mm -hmm. From there, let's say you, you roll through a tasting with me and you lean aggressively toward the rosé and the white wine. Sure. Um, at that point, storage, mm -hmm. for sure. You made the comment about storage. If you're going to drink a white or a rosé wine, I do recommend that you chill it, but we're not talking refrigerator cold. Right. It's more like the way I store wine on my wine rack at home, I store all my whites and all my reds on that wine rack. If I drink a red wine, I put it in the refrigerator for 25 minutes, pull it out, and I'm good to drink it. Okay. If I drink a white wine or a rosé wine, I put it in my freezer for 25 minutes, right. and then I pull it out and I enjoy it. Okay. So as far as maybe the temperature, that's something that we work on really hard uh, at our tasting room. Temperature, 
storage. Um, if you have a wine fridge, by all means, use a wine fridge. I would store everything at 55 degrees. Mm -hmm. If you're about to drink a white wine, maybe put it in your fridge to drop it down just a touch more. Uh, but 55 degrees is a good healthy starting point. I don't think for both reds, reds and whites. Yeah. And okay. I don't think reds show their best at 55 degrees, but create mm -hmm. an environment where, it'll, where it will warm up over time. Mm -hmm. um, now, food is the mm. biggest thing. I think yeah. <clears throat> wine is meant to be an ingredient. It's meant to go with good food or good company for that matter. But right. good food is huge. You know, you see wine and cheese pairings all the time. Cheese is a great candidate. What I've come to find is if I if I like a food that I'm eating and I like a wine I'm drinking, it's amazing how well that's going to pair. Mm -hmm. uh, but in our tasting room, I always make a lot of recommendations. From what I've seen, people do want to know how to serve it. Like this uh, Tanat, I would serve with steak all day long. Sangiovese, that's an Italian variety. You pair this Sangiovese with... Um, oh, man, a, a really heavy pasta dish. That's oh, the yeah. dream scenario. Malbec yeah. with lamb. This mm. is Malvasia Bianca. This is your seafood. Um, mm. Gosh. Rosé. Mussels, clams, yeah, oysters. Well, yeah, well, yeah, rosé and oysters. I mm -hmm. wanted to do a rosé and oyster shucking party, actually. Oh, okay. I thought that would have been a, a blast, that but then we been. had a, a global pandemic. Right. Um, Darn it all. I know, I know, right? Now, this is Syrah, and mm -hmm. this is a very rustic expression of Syrah. The first time I got to enjoy Syrah would have been Yellowtail Shiraz. <laughs> and Yellowtail Shiraz is blueberries and vanilla all day long. That's not what this is. Mm. This is very full-bodied. Um, there's peppery sensation. It dries your palate out, so that's tannin. There's um, mm -hmm. factors involved that make this wine what it is. It um, Going back to the food pairing discussion, this is going to be paired with something big and gamey. This is a... Uh, oh boar of some kind there's yeah. a cool restaurant in austin that does a lot of boar dishes yeah um i don't know that's I, good i yeah. mean it's um man. yeah what you got I'm trying I'm, my mind's trying to figure it out uh definitely yeah. less alcohol -y, yeah a lot stronger alcoholy did we just invent it we just yeah. invented a word i think <laughs> i sound totally reasonable <laughs> i have a friend, a friend he's like if you understood exactly what I'm talking about, then the word worked. Whether or not it's right. <laughs> fair <laughs> enough. Um, yeah, third. definitely the the flavor feels a lot stronger. Um, mm -hmm. well, in when I smell it. Yeah, the uh, and the third question is when to open it. You know, mm -hmm. proper storage, what to pair it with. So often people are like, so when's the best time to open this? If you're buying one bottle, you want to make that bottle count, right? Mm -hmm. And um, I usually recommend that pick a special day in the near future and uh, like make it happen. Like six months to a, to a year six near future? Six months to a year, okay. yeah. You know, I we have had people that, that buy quite a bit of our wines that have future dates set. You know, we're we're going to start having children in three years. We'll, we'll open this after we deliver our first baby. Oh, wow. we'll, mm -hmm. uh, we're going to, so this is our first anniversary. We're going to open this on our 10th anniversary. You know, we've had mm -hmm. things like that. Nice. We've got but one it, of those bottles. Yeah, yeah, wow. cool. And I think when you pick up a bottle of wine, if you tasted it that day and you enjoy it, you know that you enjoyed it that mm -hmm. day. Whether or not you'll enjoy it 10 years from now, that remains to be seen. I think wines can grow and can evolve in such a way that you might not enjoy. That's a possibility. Yeah. Uh, typically, that's not the case. Usually, they'll they'll become rounder over time, and that is very pleasant. Um, Define rounder. What does that mean? Rounder. Acid is more pronounced in wine when wine is young. So right. as a wine ages, that acid will become less pronounced and you'll feel more, basically fruit will expire and you'll feel more earth tones. Got it. Mm -hmm. It's generally what I see when I age a wine um, or with our wines particularly. Yeah. But I'm, uh, I'm glad you kind of shed light on that. Um, I always thought that all wines were good like through age. I didn't know that it was um, kind of dependent on your taste. It you know, is, right? yeah. Like our, our white and rosé wine, I used to think, you know, go ahead and drink these within a year. If you take mm -hmm. one home this time next year, that's when you need to drink it because right. they typically drink well young. A couple of weeks ago, I had a, a rosé that was, it was one of my rosés. It was a 2016. So we released this 2016 rosé on April 2nd, 2017. And on April 4th, my first daughter was born. And this past April... 
uh, we opened a 2016 rosé, a 2017 rosé, a 2018 rosé. I pulled some 2019 rosé out of the barrel, and we drank some of that. Mm-hmm. Uh, my my daughter, she's three years old now. Nice. Or my oldest daughter, she's three years old now, and she wanted a pink party. There you go. Copious yeah. amounts of pink wine. There yeah. you go. And uh, it was a blast. Our little pandemic birthday party. Yeah. Um, had her friends. Awesome. Yeah, they signed nice. in on Zoom, and that was cool. Oh, that's that's fun. Cool. Um, but that wine ended up tasting really, really nice, the 2016 rosé. Mm-hmm. So it aged gracefully over a period of, you know, three years, um, yeah. four years if you count the harvest date. But, yeah, the aging of wine, it's a funny little game to play. There is no set rule. Mm-hmm. It depends on what you like. But when it comes to, you know, so store wine properly, quite certainly. Pair right. it with a good food, quite certainly. Mm-hmm. But don't overdo it. All right. Well, Henry, this uh, I think uh, we need to talk about the Syrah. Uh, this right, is yeah. the last one. The last one we've got, and we'll uh, we'll go ahead and, and land this this plane. Unfortunately, uh, as much as we'd like to continue yeah, the conversation, yeah. clearly. Um, but uh, so, tell me about the Syrah. What's uh, what's unique about it, or or where did the grapes come from? What's what's the story here? So, Syrah, the grape, is from southern France. Right, uh, it grows most famously in the northern Rhone, mm-hmm. and right now it does do well in Texas. Uh, but it's a, it's a funny little game to play. Every Syrah seems to be so different. And this Syrah in particular, mm-hmm. it's, <laughs> it's juicy and rustic and interesting. I mean, you guys will have tasting notes quite certainly, but right. I think uh, I love it. It's also, I only made two barrels of this wine. Really? That in perspective, I made five barrels of this wine. Yeah. Uh, but making two barrels of wine, not a whole lot. It's also famous for being the only wine I've ever foot stomped. Oh, oh wow. did you really? Right. Yeah. So most wines. You tell us that. Yeah. You tell us that after we drink it. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I smelled. I feet. sterilize my feet, but the uh, <laughs> so we have machines that do a lot of that work for us these days, and uh, that's, I, that's actually pretty cool. It is. It is. Yeah. And you know, you see that I love Lucy would be the most. Uh, yeah, that, that, yeah, that was the first thing that popped yeah. in mind. And foot stomping for us took place before fermentation. When fermentation happens and that yeast is eating sugar, creating alcohol, that's a very stable environment. It's burning yeah. off all the all the stuff though foot stomping is a very secure thing and i did clean my feet quite aggressively before hopping in those bins mm-hmm. but I, we had two bins of grapes and each bin that we harvest holds a, a half ton so about a thousand pounds worth of grapes uh, and had two bins of this i had this beautiful mental image i was like man i'm gonna hop in our first ever syrah and these two beautiful pistons attached to my body are just gonna be firing i'm just gonna be pulverizing these grapes with my feet and we're gonna make a beautiful wine I hopped in the bin and it was not the way I pictured. It was <laughs> miserable. I'm never foot stomping a wine again. It was it was a whole berries and it was just difficult. Wow. And um, but we've got the story. Yeah. We've got yeah. the story. There are some people that they will foot stomp during fermentation, which uh-huh. is really uh-huh. quite a bit easier. But f- like foot stomping whole grapes that have not been fermented is incredibly difficult. And I learned that uh, right, from right. the Syrah. Well, you have the experience, and, yeah. and I'm sure the uh, battle scars on the bottom of your feet to uh, <laughs> to prove it. So it was a it was a memory. All right. yeah. yeah. So what is your? We, uh, we talked about this during during the break. What is your favorite grape that grows in Texas? If I were to plant a vineyard tomorrow and put one grape in it, it'd be Muved. Muved. Muved spelled more Vedra, M O U R V E D R E. But and more pronounced bedroom. about a dozen ways, depending on who yeah. you're talking to in <laughs> Central Texas. You know, we were laughing about it earlier. The, all those amazing European countries named all these wines or wine grapes. Mm-hmm. You know, they named Sangiovese and Zinfandel and Syrah and Malvasia yeah. Bianca. If they'd have left it up to East Texas winemakers, <laughs> and I grew up in East Texas, you know, it would have been Bob and <laughs> Steve. And Steve's great. Got to name it after a president, Washington. Yeah. There you go. You know, but um, yeah, so Muved. Uh, I drop those R's when I pronounce it, um, kind of like that famous museum in Paris. Yeah. The Louvre. The Louvre. Same deal. Yeah. Right. So to Muved, um, the way it grows here, it just seems to be happy. And I did not yeah. bring one. We do make a Muved. In fact, in 2019, we processed Muved that was harvested in the Texas Hill Country and Muved that was harvested in the Texas High Plains. Combined in the same bottle? Negative Ghost Rider. All we right. are going to pour them separately. Okay, good. Uh, yeah. So, but it'll be a part of the same tasting. So, this coming fall, we'll release Hill Country Muved and serve it adjacent to Texas High Plains Muved. Cool. That'd be interesting. And yeah. Give you an idea of exactly, you know, going back to that idea of Tehua, mm-hmm. 
Mm -hmm. What impact did the Hill Country soil profile and weather patterns have on this wine versus the Texas High Plains? Right. Um, yeah. Soil and weather patterns. And the winemaker is the same. So you've got your controls. Sure. But the vineyard site is what's going to change in that little side-by-side -side yeah. tasting. It'll be super interesting. But Mivet is what I, what I really believe in. Um, and it's actually from the same region in France as Syrah. Gotcha. In which wow. we just tasted. So why, why Lubbock? Why the why the Texas High Plains? How how did it? Um, I mean, obviously the the environment sets, lends itself well, but I mean, you look at Napa Valley and all these flowing hills, and it's gorgeous <laughs> and it's green, and then you look at just outside of Lubbock, yeah, and it's brown and it's dirty and it's windy and it's dry. But it is ironically high elevation. Okay, so in Johnson so that's City, the we're at we're at thirteen hundred feet elevation. In Brownfield, where the uh, Rosé, Malvasia, Malbec, Zinfandel, and Tanat were farmed. They're at 3,200 feet elevation. Okay. So they're almost 2,000 feet higher, double. which does promote it's drier air, yes, but with a higher elevation, you get this diurnal temperature shift. Diurnal mm. temperature shift. Sif, shift say, to, hot, say that five times. Which, which way is up? <laughs> but hot days, cold nights is really ideal for the development of wine grapes, and they have okay. that. Now, in the 70s, a gentleman by the name of Doc McPherson, I believe it was the 70s. It could quite possibly have been the 80s. Mm -hmm. But Doc McPherson planted grapevines on the roof of the biology building at Texas Tech. And that was the beginning of Texas viticulture as we know it. And that's oh. a true story. That's interesting. Yeah. And his is that the same McPherson as Mc Mc that's McPherson right. Sellers? That's right. Yeah. So he had, right. one of his sons is making wine um, in California. Okay. I believe in the, uh, well, I, I don't want to. Be right. wrong, mm -hmm. but Kim McPherson still makes wine mm -hmm. in Lubbock, and uh, I'll, I'll, we I'll, I'll we love like. We like my first he, He's a he's a great guy. He's yeah. one of the best white winemakers in Texas. His white wines are yeah stellar. Um, they, they make a their their Trey Calor, I think is is, uh, is is my wife and mine's favorite. Yeah, man, he's a he's a really fun guy to be around. But his dad yeah. his dad was really the beginning of of what we're experiencing right now. That's and Texas Tech does have the. Uh, Viticulture and Enology program, the V&E mm -hmm. programs of viticulture, study of grapevines, mm -hmm. enology, the study of winemaking. Mm -hmm. Texas Tech currently offers that, um, which is really cool. And again, that's because of Doc. But that's why the Texas High Plains have, there's a lot of cotton farmers that are converting to grapes. Yep. So cotton, I think, uses six times more water yes. than grapes do. Yes. So a lot of these guys are like, man, uses less water, could quite possibly be more profitable in the yep. good years. Because cotton's treated like a commodity. The price is essentially set. Yep. You could have way no better control. cotton than your neighbor. It doesn't matter. It's just right. going to go and be sold. Right. Whereas grapes, if you're growing better fruit than the guy next to you, yeah, you're going to get paid a premium. Get a premium. You deserve that yeah. because we're drinking the resulting product. Exactly. Yeah. You know, it better be good. Exactly. It better be. So a lot of guys who have been farming their entire lives. In fact, the guy that farmed this Syrah, um, this was farmed in Seagraves, Texas. He has a 30-acre vineyard. But he also still farms a thousand acres of cotton and six hundred acres of peanuts. This guy's a farmer. Yeah. For him, it's a form yeah. of crop diversification. Yeah. But he's a smart guy. He realizes I've never farmed grapes before, so he hired a uh, vineyard management company, and they're helping him manage his vineyard, which is brilliant because these guys they know what they're doing. Yeah. Um, so I think there's they're set up for farming practices out in the Texas High Plains in the hill mm -hmm. country. I think it's coming. I think we're going to start seeing couple of vineyard management companies here in the Texas Hill Country yeah. uh, to quite possibly promote more farming in the Texas Hill Country. Mm -hmm. However, land prices is always going to be a hurdle. Right. And you guys are in the mortgage real estate market. Yep. Land prices in the Hill Country They're for farming. Up. Yeah. It's yeah. it's really tough to, to rationalize that. We're going to plant our state vineyard sometime in the next several years. Um, a dream scenario is spring 2022. We'll plant a vineyard outside of Johnson City. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's a, that's a matter of time and money mm -hmm. for sure. And I'm excited about that. I think it's special to have your, your estate local vineyard. We're going to harvest grapes and drive three minutes down the road to the yeah. winery and mm -hmm. process that fruit. That matters to me. And being a part of the farming process matters to me. Mm -hmm. However, right now the Texas high plains is producing quality fruit. Right. Um, and, and has much, been for many years. Yeah. At, at better prices than what yep. you can get mm -hmm. in the Texas hill country. And it is yeah. a business. Um, and well, there's also more of it. You know, Hell Country, it's hard to come by yeah. good fruit. Well, f uh, this has been an absolutely fascinating 
conversation yeah. uh, for uh, for us to be a part of. I know I've thoroughly enjoyed it, and not just because of the wine, uh, yeah. just because <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I mean it, to have somebody on here as knowledgeable knowledgeable as you uh, in uh, and and just kind of and someone who's so passionate about just the subject matter, but also passionate about educating uh, average consumers like myself and Raul on what you need to look for. That's, uh, that, that's a huge benefit. And I think we'll just add to the enjoyment that, uh, that certainly me as well as yeah. our listeners will, will have. So if somebody wants to get in touch with you or somebody wants to follow you on social media, what's the best way for them to do that? So, um, uh, is okay. our website, C R O W S O N W I N E S.com. All right. That's where our online store is located. Um, and we got our online store up and running mm-hmm. the week we had to close the tasting room due to due to lockdown. Sure, but it's it's hopping. It's fun to be able to to share wine online. Uh, on Facebook, it's Croson, mm-hmm. and uh, on Instagram, it's at Croson Wines. At Croson Wines, and that's it. And Just we're like you are. exactly, okay. and we're not. Uh, I need to be better at posting <laughs> social media, but hey, we're getting there. Don't we all? You know, yeah. we're. Um, we're getting there, but right. I don't. So Facebook, yeah. Instagram, Facebook, website, Instagram and, website. Website. and you've got an online store. So any of the wines that we've been tasting tonight, well, uh, except for, except <laughs> except for, the, for first the first two, two yeah, the, you got it. I'm gotta, hoping the first two will be up online in the next couple of days. Yeah. You, nice. got, you, you, um, might, you might have to wake up, uh, wait up to about six days. If you want yeah. to try the, uh, f- try those two new releases that he brought us. The, uh, tasting them today though, they're ready. I oh yeah, think, uh, oh, man. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm pretty sick and excited about that's, them. That's my opinion too. Yeah, it'll, yeah. Be, it'll be hot outside. <laughs> Independence Day is yeah. coming up. There you oh, go. Man. Well, it's gonna be nice. I guess we're a month away. Hot dogs and rosé, and that the, hot that dogs the, uh, and rosé, and that the yeah. the tasting event you were gonna host. I think so, man. Maybe a cheese plate or two. <laughs> no, maybe you got the hot dogs. What hot else? Hot dogs do you need? and rosé. All right, yeah, there you right, go. Yeah, that's good. All right, and and I'm not kidding about that idea about about doing a, a wine anomics. Uh, spinoff of this podcast. Like, I'm in. I, I will. I will drive out to Johnson City. We'll set up at that farm table you got in your tasting room, and we'll just sit and talk wine for a couple hours. I'm in. All right. I'm in. Cool. Bring it cool. on. All right. Well, thank you very much for tuning in. And uh, like I said, I'm James Duncan, Henry Croson from uh, Croson uh, Croson Wines out in Johnson City. Go look them up. Go to their website. Order some wine. You will not be disappointed. It's uh, it's fantastic stuff, and and Henry is about as passionate as they come when it comes to winemaking. Thank you, Raul, for uh, for joining uh, joining us with the uh, with the wine tasting oh, and man, handling all the production responsibilities. <laughs> yeah. So this was definitely the most uh, the most enter- entertaining, the most fun podcast that we've had today. <laughs> yeah, definitely, so, man. Um, excellent stuff. Yeah, I'm gonna cue the music, and then we'll get just our last cheers. All right. I love it. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. Need a little, little time extra in your game. Love to see it. Yeah. Yeah. This is Thrivenomics. The title sponsor of this show is Thrive Mortgage. Licensed in multiple states across the U.S., Thrive Mortgage employs the best professionals equipped with leading technology and the most efficient process to deliver a legendary lending experience. For more information about how we can serve you or to find a local mortgage professional in your area, please visit us at thrivemortgage.com. Thrive Mortgage is an equal housing lender. NMLS number 268552.